Thank you. Well, welcome to the discussion portion of our Global Poverty and Development Day. And I want to start with some very important introductions. Uh, professors William Easterly and Thomas Poggi, I would like to introduce you to an amazing student body of United Nations International School junior and senior students, what we call T3, T4 students, uh, of the class of 2014 and 2015. Our school student body is representative of 120 countries and is likely the most international high school in the world. Say hello, students. <laughs> students, I would like to introduce you to our esteemed visiting speakers. We welcome today uh, Professors William Easterly and Thomas Poggi to share perspectives on global poverty and development. Professor William Easterly, here to my left, is an American economist specializing in economic growth and foreign aid. He is a professor of economics at New York University and co-director of NYU's Development Research Institute. He is a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution in Washington, D.C and is an associate editor of the Quarterly Journal of Economics, the Journal of Economic Growth, and of the Journal of Development Economics. His PhD was earned at MIT, and from 1985 to 2001, he worked at the World Bank as a research economist. He's the author of three books, uh, including the recently published The Tyranny of Experts, Economists, Dictators, and the Forgotten Rights of the Poor, as well as The White Man's Burden. Professor Thomas Poggi is a German philosopher and director of the Global Justice Program and the Leitner Professor of Philosophy and International Affairs at Yale University. Having received his PhD in philosophy from Harvard, Thomas Poggi has published widely on Kant and in moral and political philosophy. He is the research director of the Center for the Study of the Mind in Nature at the University of Oslo and Professor of Political Philosophy at the Center for Professional Ethics of the University of Central Lancashire. He's also a professor at King's College in London. Professor Poggi is an editor for Social and Political Philosophy for the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy and a member of the Norwegian Academy of Science and Letters. His books uh, include Politics as Usual, What Lies Behind the Pro-Poor Rhetoric, The Health Impact Fund, Making New Medicines Accessible for All, and World Poverty and Human Rights. <laughs> Our discussion this morning will consist of an opening introduction from each speaker, and they're going to present to us their view of global poverty and development, and the framework that is their body of work on this important topic. I will then ask some questions for each speaker to respond to. And at approximately 11.30, 11.40, um, I will open the floor to student questions. We will start first here uh, with Professor Pogge's introduction. So development is a very big topic these days, partly because the MDGs, the Millennium Development Goals, are set to expire in the year 2015, and there's a lively debate in this very city about what will take their place. People are talking about the Sustainable Development Goals for the next 15-year period. So what is the experience with the Millennium Development Goals? Uh, basically, the official story is, well, you know, we didn't achieve everything we wanted in every place that we wanted to achieve it, but we've done pretty well. We've lifted a lot of people out of poverty. We've been quite successful. And uh, I think Rosling's thing that you saw earlier probably also goes a bit in that direction. I want to throw a little bit of cold water on this and give you a little bit of cause for skepticism. Starting off with this slide here that shows you how the world's income distribution has developed over the years from 1988 to 2008, which are basically the years of the Millennium Development Goal period, 1990 to 2015. 
What you see here is that the poorest three-tenths of the world's population have lost ground in relative terms. That doesn't mean that they got poorer necessarily, but it means that they lost ground relative to the rest of the human population. And you can also see that the richest 5%, that's you guys, have done pretty well. They have gained about 3% of global household income during that period. So I know some of you don't like numbers, so I've also put this into a somewhat more appealing format. And you can see here exactly the same information again, what happened over this period. Essentially, the top 5% are the big gainers. And, and I'll click the wrong button. Sorry about that. So they are the big gainers, and the big loss in relative terms is really in the bottom quintile, the bottom 20% of the population, uh, where really quite a significant uh, amount of loss took place. So to summarize that in words, <coughs> we can say that in these 20 years, the richest 5% of humanity have gained about 3% of global household income, which is just about the same amount that the poorer half had left at the end of that period, which is quite a remarkable fact, I think. Had the poorest 30% held steady, their income now would be about 21% higher, supposing that growth had taken place at the same rate. And had that 3% of global household income that was added to the share of the top 5% gone to the bottom half, poverty would already be history as of now or as of 2008. That would have sufficed, would have brought the bottom half up from their three point something to six point something percent and would have sufficed to wipe out all poverty in this world. This is what the world would then look like. You 5% would still be doing rather well, but the bottom two quintiles would be a little better off or actually a lot better off, relatively speaking, and that would suffice to end poverty. Now, how come that the news are not that good, or at least this doesn't sound very good, and how come that the news from the poverty front, the official news, is so much better? It's in part, I think, because the way the statistics work, and I want to run through a few little things here. Uh, the first time the goal of halving poverty and hunger popped up, was, uh, in a big way, was the World Food Summit in Rome, 1996, where 186 governments got together and said that they would half uh, the number of chronically undernourished people. You can see here the exact text. Also, I highlight the word immediate, because for a philosopher like myself, that's a little bit amusing to say that we have this goal of eradicating poverty, and immediately we will, in 19 years, half it. So imagine uh, Roosevelt saying this in 1942, you know, we are very upset about the Nazis and we are so upset that we will half the number of inmates in concentration camps by 1961. That would have been a rather remarkable statement. Anyway, our government said that and they were congratulated for their effort. Now this is the mathematics at the beginning. We had 788 officially uh, chronically undernourished people, we wanted to get that down by 50%. So 394 is the target number. So sometimes works and sometimes not. Yeah. So in 2010, the official number was 925 million chronically undernourished people. And so we have plus 17% where really we were supposed to get minus 50. This is not particularly good. So four years later, our governments passed the Millennium Declaration of the year 2000, where they said that they would halve poverty by 2015, same old thing, but this time they said we will have the proportion, not the number, but the proportion of chronically undernourished people. And the proportion, as you know, is a ratio, and in this case, the ratio of hungry people over the world's population. Now, since the world's population is growing, that means that part of the work of halving the proportion is done by population growth and less work needs to be done by actually reducing the number of undernourished people. Everybody gets that? And so it's a little easier to half undernutrition if you define it as a proportion rather than as a number. 
So let's quickly do the maths. We start with the 2,000 number, which is 833 million. Relate that to the population of the world at that time. Aim to half that proportion. And we get a new target number of 480 million people whose uh, malnutrition is permissible in the year 2015. So we've added 86 million to the number of those whose under nutrition in the year 2015 will be celebrated as a success. And look again at the year 2010. Again, we relate it now to the world's population, and we find that, well, we have still gone in the wrong direction, but not so dramatically anymore. It's not a 17% failure. It's now just a 2% failure, 2% in the wrong direction. What to do? Well, our friends at the United Nations uh, knew what to do. They uh, reformulated the goals stipulated in the Millennium De Declaration into the Millennium Development Goals. And again, they chose a slightly different formulation. Namely, they talk now about the proportion of chronically undernourished people in the population of the developing countries. And they have lengthened the target period from the year 2000 backwards to 1990. So they chose a different baseline. Obviously, this has impact in the following ways. If you use the population of the developing countries, that grows. It's also the good thing that China, as we all know, was very successful in reducing poverty and undernutrition in the 1990s. And so why not count that success towards the Millennium Development Goals? That's what they did systematically with all the MDGs. They backdated the whole lot. The word 1990 never occurs in the Millennium Declaration, which was officially passed by the UN General Assembly, but it occurs in all the goals everywhere in the MDGs. So here's the official formulation, which you find in every Millennium Development Report. And here is the mathematics. So we start with the number of 1990. This is now the number of undernourished in the developing countries. So it's all a little bit different because we leave out the developed world and we want to do a 50% reduction, and what we find is that the new permissible number of undernourished people in the year 2015 is 611 million. This is just in the developing world. The developed world is left out to count. So now we compare that 910 is now the slightly reduced number because we're leaving out the developed world, and we find that, lo and behold, for the first time, we are moving in the right direction, and now we have achieved a 21% reduction in undernutrition over the period 1990 to 2010. Of course, the number of undernourished has increased, as you can see, but the proportion has decreased by 21%. Now, a 21% reduction is still not what we want, right? We want 50% over 25 years, and if we just achieve 21%, in 20 years, that's not good. But at least we are looking a little better. So what do we do about, I mean, this is again a quick summary. These are the three different promises of halving undernutrition by 2015. With their permissible number of undernourished people in, on the right, and these are our scorecards. 17% in the wrong direction, 2% in the wrong direction, 21% in the right direction. So what do we do about the fact that we're still failing with that 21% number? Well, something remarkable happened in 2012, namely the FAO, our good daughter organization of the UN uh, that is in charge of food and agriculture, changed its methodology for how they count the hungry. And so they came up with a new methodology. Can anybody predict what the new numbers will show? Will the number in 1990, the number of hungry people, will that be higher or lower? Higher as well. Good. Here you go. All right. So in 1990, it turns out, hunger was catastrophically worse than we had ever imagined. And in 2010, hunger is actually much better. Some of you may know especially those who come from the developing world, that food prices doubled between about 2006 and 2009. 
and that that had devastating effects in many developing countries. In particular, there were major food riots in many countries that had something to do also with the Arab Spring. And so that left no trace anymore with the new numbers. The new methodology, the poor people never noticed that food prices doubled. Uh, it doesn't seem to have affected them in any way. In any case, these are the new numbers, and now everything looks much better. We have now got a new permissible number of chronically undernourished people in the year 2015 of 724 million, much higher because the baseline was much higher. The 1990 number has been increased. And we have a 36% success. We have gone 36% in the right direction now with these new numbers and the Millennium Development Goal methodology. So this is the infographic that the FAO helpfully then added to its 2012 report. And you can see we are on the glide path pretty much. You know, it's a little hiccup. We are not quite on the glide path. But this is the picture that gets presented to the world. We have not achieved everything we wanted to, but we have achieved a lot, so let's not be too hard on ourselves. Now, you have to pay a price sometimes for changing the methodology for counting the hungry. And the price here is that you place one pretty lousy methodology with another pretty lousy methodology. And in particular, if you want to count as hungry by the new methodology of the FAO, you have to fulfill three conditions. You have to be short of energy. So if you're short of vitamins or proteins or anything, it doesn't matter, it doesn't count. So the only way you can be undernourished is if you're short calories. Secondly, you have to be short of the amount of calories that is adequate to cover even minimum needs for a sedentary lifestyle. Now, I'm an expert on a sedentary lifestyle because that's, I have one. But I know one thing for sure, and you can probably confirm that, few people in the developing world have sedentary lifestyles, right? They don't have dishwashers or washing machines, and they work pretty hard. And so this is a ridiculously low caloric threshold to say that you have to fall below this thing to count as undernourished. And you have to be undernourished in that minimalist sense for over a year. Now notice this is all quotes. This is not something that I make up. It's on page 50 of the Sophie State of World of Food Insecurity Report of the FAO of 2012, where they define the new methodology. And one advantage of this methodology is there cannot be a hungry Richard driver, for example, right? It cannot be biologically impossible because if you ride a rickshaw every day and you have the caloric intake less than the minimum needs of a sedentary lifestyle, you die long before the year is up, and so you will never get through this whole year so to then at the end of the year be counted among the other knowledge. Okay, so you take some drastic measures in order to achieve the numbers. Now, I want to leave you with four little lessons. First lesson is going forward into the new goals, the successor goals to the MDGs. Let's define them in advance, and let's not, as was done, not just with the hunger goal, but with a lot of different goals, uh, including also the poverty goal. Let's not allow anybody to redefine and redefine and redefine again what the goals are, how they get measured, and so on. With hindsight, knowing what different decisions on these uh, questions will deliver by way of numbers and trend lines in particular. So no midstream revisions with hindsight. Secondly, don't let weak and vulnerable international agencies monitor progress. These agencies are beholden to governments, and governments, of course, want to show that their policies work, that our globalization project is a success, and so on and so forth. They come under pressure. In this case, the pressure was partly from the World Bank. The World Bank had for years and years reported drastically falling poverty numbers, and they were embarrassed every time I asked the question loudly, how come poverty is going down, 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 and hunger is going up all the time? How can that be? And the World Bank, instead of answering me, basically pressured the FAO to change the hunger numbers to bring them into conformity with the World Bank's poverty numbers, or so I suspect. So independent experts should be in charge of the monitoring. The third thing is that we should have proper goals. Let's not have a wish list. This should happen, this should happen. 
But let's have goals where specific competent agents are put in charge of achieving specific things. And again, that I think is important in order also to get the richer countries who are much better able to make progress on the poverty front to shoulder some of the burden. Otherwise it becomes more a race among various countries where each country is put in charge of its own poverty and hunger numbers and so on. And then of course the poorest countries with the highest poverty rates get the largest tasks to complete, whereas rich countries have to do almost nothing to get their minuscule percentages down. And finally, and that's maybe the main lesson uh, that I want to draw, is let's not focus our attention solely on this little corner of our international architecture called development assistance. Let's look at the entire spectrum of institutions because they have strong distributional effects. So if the poor are falling behind, if they're not participating proportionately in economic growth, this is not because of development assistance. The development assistance doesn't do that much damage. It's because other things do damage, and in particular, trade agreements, protectionism, uh, intellectual property rights, and so on and so forth, a whole litany of other factors. And in setting these other parameters of our global institutional order, we have to keep the poor constantly in mind and anticipate how decisions about these institutions affect the poor. And so the kinds of goals that I would recommend for the next goal period would be institutional reform goals, such as these ones here. I have no time to go through them in detail, but at least I'll put them up. If this clicker works every sixth time or so, but here it is. Maybe I have to point it in the right direction. That's just it, pointing it in the right direction. Okay, so these are sort of some ideas which you can maybe quickly grasp. If anybody wants the PowerPoint, I'm very happy to share it, by the way. And that would really uh, make a difference to poverty on the ground because it would commit, in particular, the richer governments and their uh, corporations to various changes in the way that they do business that would reduce the burdens that our global institutional architecture is imposing on the poor. Okay, on the opening slide, you see the title of my presentation. I would not want to do anything so crass as promote any recent book I may or may not have published, which is now available at Amazon, and your book independent booksellers, <laughs> your friends, your parents, aunts and uncles, cousins. They may be very interested in this topic. What this talk is going to complain about is that in, in the global war on poverty, the mainstream approach has embraced a dictator's approach to poverty and rejected a democratic approach to poverty. Let me explain how we got to that point. So the, the mainstream approach is really thinking about reducing poverty is really a technical exercise. So it's a long list of technical answers to technical problems of the poor such as, for example, if you want to fight malaria, there's a chemical called pyrethrum that you can spray on the walls of houses that will kill the mosquitoes. If you want to fight malnutrition, there are vitamin A capsules that address one dimension, as Thomas mentioned, of, of malnutrition. If you want to reduce soil erosion, there are terraces that prevent, prevent land and soil erosion. If you want clean water, you drill wells, you drill boreholes. So all of these technical solutions seem very straightforward and so it seems like the answers to poverty should be relatively simple. You just get a bunch of technical experts who specify these solutions and bang, you have solved the problem of poverty. But this approach leaves unanswered two big questions. Who is actually doing these technical solutions? And whoever they are, why didn't they do them already? If they were so easy and had such high payoff, why didn't they do them already? And development shows a remarkable lack of curiosity about these two questions. The answer to the first question is who is doing them? It's usually the government in power, who are usually dictators. So what you get is, in practice, a combination of sort of experts specifying technical solutions, advising dictators. This sort of alliance of experts and autocrats is often called technocrats. 
technocrat the technocratic approach to ending poverty. And it's an inherently an authoritarian, top-down approach to development. So is it really true that, that aid works a lot with dictators? Well, let me give one example from Ethiopia involving three different aid agencies. Uh, USAID celebrated how the Ethiopian autocrat named Mele Sanawi, who was in power for 20 years in Ethiopia, had made, quote, tremendous progress. World Bank President Jim Kim joined the chorus, celebrating Ethiopia's, uh, what he called, transformational change under Meles, which he attributed to Meles. Um, Bill Gates, the head of the Gates Foundation, said that Ethiopian autocrat Meles Tanawi had made what he said, quote, made real progress in helping the people of Ethiopia. But now let's go to the second question. Why were the technical solutions not already happening? Why is Ethiopia so poor to begin with? There's an alternative point of view that autocracy and dictators are not the solution to Ethiopia's poverty, they are the cause of Ethiopia's poverty. And we have other ev direct evidence that somebody like Meles Hanawi is not so benevolent. A Human Rights Watch in 2010 in Ethiopia caught Meles and his government red-handed in limiting famine relief only to members of the ruling party and denying it to opposition party members. The donors of this famine relief, the World Bank, the US Agency for International Development, the British Aid Agency, they all promised to investigate this shocking human rights violation. Six months later, they quietly informed Human Rights Watch that they were not doing the investigation. And the sad thing about this is nobody in development seemed to notice this. It seems like the human rights, the democratic rights of the poor just have an incredibly low profile in development. No one seems to care, no one seems to monitor the rights violations of the donors and the dictators. Malas was actually a serial rights abuser. He had killed demonstrators after rigged elections in 2005. He had seized farmers' lands at gunpoint in a program known as villagization. He had sentenced a peaceful blogger named Eskinder Nega to 18 years in prison just for writing innocuous, nonviolent blog about democracy as a good thing. Sentenced him to 18 years in prison in 2012, he's still there. The alternative to autocracy is democratic rights. So we have a pretty good theory of how democratic rights can actually do good things for us. First of all, we desire them in and of themselves as a good thing. Democratic rights just means no one can force you to do something you don't want to do. And all of us like that. All of us treat that as something we want inherently, in and of itself, that we won't, don't want to be forced to do something we don't want to do. That's you know, the core value of democratic rights, your, your freedom to be uncoerced, to make your own choices, to run your own life. And second, democratic rights, uh, there's a well-developed theory by political scientists and economists that democratic rights are at the heart of how technical solutions actually do happen. The governments are not naturally benevolent. Democratic rights force them to be benevolent. So democratic rights give the citizens the right to hold their government officials accountable when they do bad things to them. They can punish them politically. They can protest. They can they have freedom of the media to spread negative stories about the, the government in power that's failing on the technical solutions. Conversely, you can have positive stories and peace and support, express a lot of support for politicians who do successfully implement the technical solutions. And then you can vote to keep the pol successful politicians who do the technical solutions in power and vote out those who do not. So that's, democracy is a mechanism that allows us to protest whenever our government does bad things to us and to reward the government by voting for it and keeping it in power when it does good things for us. So that's a, it's a, a meta institution that makes the technical solutions work. It also empowers the economic system, protects our economic rights, which also makes it possible for economic entrepreneurs to make, meet some of our needs that are met by the private sector, by the market. So let me give you a little illustration of how, uh, how powerful democratic rights are. How many had, of you had actually heard of the story that I told of the human rights violation in Ethiopia in 2010 of the Melissa Nawi had denied famine relief to members of the opposition. How many of you have heard? Just raise your hands. That's encouraging. There's a few of you who have heard. 
Okay, how many of you have heard of the story of Chris Christie, the governor of New Jersey, creating a traffic jam on the bridge in New Jersey? Everyone has heard of that. So we punish Chris Christie even for something so trivial as a traffic jam on a bridge, which is so much less bad than killing demonstrators and sentencing bloggers to 18 years in jail and denying famine relief to the opposition. That's our democracy now. Now, how do we get to this point that we have this sort of autocratic approach to development? Here we need to take a look at history. So, you know, one thing history teaches us is that uh, most of the rich countries today did take a democratic path to development. There, were, there was no democratic utopias anywhere in the world. They did take a democratic path to development. So places like uh, North America and Japan and Western Europe took a democratic path to development, more recently followed by countries like Botswana, Taiwan, and South Korea. Well, why did this not, why was this model not followed when uh, the, the new former colonial countries became independent after the end of colonialism? Why were they not offered the democratic path to development instead of the experts advising autocrats, the authoritarian path to development? To understand that, we have to go back a little bit into history to realize that the origins of develop, the idea of development really started during colonial times. Let me give you a, an example of that. This is a, comparing a set of technical solutions that were already identified in colonial times in a colonial report that was written in 1938 by a British official named Lord Haley. I'm not gonna read this slide to you. Just look, see, here's four separate problems. I actually already mentioned them very sneakily at the beginning setting up this slide. Um, and I also point out that these same technical solutions were mentioned again in a United Nations report that was written in 2005. The British report, 1938, colonial vision and Lord Haley, the UN report, I don't remember exactly who authored it, I think it was Angelina Jolie. If any of you knows different, please let me know. I, that's my best guess. It may have been Bono. Um, so, here's, here's emphasizing the point I mentioned already. If it wasn't that we didn't know the technical solutions, they were already known seven decades ago. Now almost eight decades ago. And so the question is, if they were already known back in 1938, why weren't they done already? Well. One reason they weren't done already is that we've had a long series of autocrats in power, and Af this is applied to Africa, we've had a long series of autocrats in power continuously in Africa that did not have the incentive to implement the technical solutions, the core problem of authoritarian development that I've pointed out to you. The first autocrat that was already in power in 1938 was the British colonial empire. They were autocrats, they were dictators themselves. They gave no rights whatsoever to the political rights of, they gave no political rights to their African subjects whatsoever. In fact, they actually used the technocratic view of development as a justification for their colonial empire. Their empire was bringing to Africa the technical solutions that would end poverty in Africa. It was a great justification for empire. So it was actually a, uh, a colonial uh, memo that, put, that set out this this justification for empire during World War II when there was a lot of debate on whether the British Empire should continue or not. The colonial office put it down in a memo that I have actually seen online, put down in the memo saying that we're gonna have a forward policy in material development. The technocratic approach is always about the material poverty of the poor. It places no weight on the, on the political rights of the poor. In fact, it suggested that, the same memo suggested any pursuit of political ideals, quote, any pursuit of political ideals, would be, quote, to the detriment of the preeminent need for improving the material conditions, for alleviating material poverty. So this was a great justification for the British Empire, that they were, they didn't have to give political rights to Africans because they were involved in first solving the material needs of Africans, and only after that problem was solved, should we begin talking about political rights. This seems like such a great justification for, for empire that the colonial secretary, the secretary of state for the colonies in Britain, 
wrote a three-word cover note on top of this memo that I've seen online that just said this. <laughs> this is really great. This is the best idea ever to justify the British colonial empire. We are the technocrats ending African poverty. Now what's, what's in it? And at this time, they had no expectations whatsoever that the British empire would be ending anytime soon. They thought it would be continuing for centuries, and they made statements to that effect. What's interesting about this is that after colonialism did collapse much sooner than expected, uh, the new autocrats in power, which were the indigenous autocrats, the indigenous dictators in power in Africa, they found the same technocratic ideas to be good justification for their rule. So it's very ironic that the ideas that had appealed to racist colonial, colonialist powers also appealed to anti-racist, anti-colonialist new dictators in African countries. Essentially what we used to call in medieval times the divine right of kings became the development right of dictators. Again, a great justification for the tyranny of experts, the alliance of experts and dictators that justifies dictators staying in power. And this was also uh, very convenient for the US, uh, foreign for US foreign policy needs, this idea of dictators serving a development role. Because the US during the Cold War, they wanted the dictators on their side during the Cold War. They were happy to have autocratic allies who made much more reliable allies than democratic allies. And so this was kind of a dream, a marriage made in heaven, or a marriage made in hell, perhaps, of a technocratic idea that appealed both to US national security interests and to the dictators that were already in power in Africa. And then it also appealed to a third group, us development experts. So, why did it appeal to us, the development experts? Well, one reason is that we realized that development would have a much larger, uh, would be a much larger political force in the, in, U in the US and in other Western powers if we made a strategic alliance with national security interests. And so there became this sort of alliance of humanitarians, US foreign policy interests, and the autocrats in power. And this alliance all agreed that this idea of sort of dictators implementing development solutions was a good idea that kind of served the interests of all three parties, the alliance. So this is sort of the alliance, the, al the threefold alliance between the development experts and dictators and US foreign policy needs like during the Cold War. Now the expert part, I have to in introduce a small personal angle here is why, why we experts went along with this. Now, one reason is we, we are very, we do want to have a powerful effect on changing the world. And this view of the world suggested that we, our technical solutions do have a powerful effect, that our expert ideas have a powerful effect on changing the world. And that tapped into our idealistic desire to make the world a better place. And here was a set of ideas that allowed us a way to, to powerfully change the world, to alleviate poverty through our technical expert ideas. Now, a little bit less charitably, you could also say we like this idea because it placed us, the experts, and made us the heroes of the story. And there's something very seductive about it. Uh, and I'm, again, speaking as having been an expert myself for 16 years at the World Bank. It's very seductive. It's very hard to resist a story that makes you the hero of the story. I've been trying to get over that ever since. I've been sort of a recovering expert. Sort of started my own group of authoritarians, anonymous, trying to uh, meet in church basements on Wednesday nights, uh, exchange you know, recovery stories. Uh, so you know, it's hard to it's hard to resist this view of the world that places us experts at the center. But in the end. As experts or as economists, we are forced to acknowledge the power of the simple <coughs> economic and political ideas we have. That really, it was false that benevolent dictators are benevolent. Or not. The governments are never naturally benevolent. Oops. Sorry. Just had a major water spill at a critical moment. That was, thank you, Melissa Nawi. Um, so let me get back on track here. The, the governments are never naturally benevolent when they're, when they're dictators. Thank you. Thanks for looking over the water stuff. 
no, no animals were harmed during the performance of this lecture. Uh, governments are never naturally benevolent when they're dictators. But dictators, what are their incentives? Their incentives are to stay in power. They stay in power through coercion and repression. Uh, if they get aid, they can just use that aid for more coercion and repression. That's their incentives. Governments are only benevolent and, and actually choose to implement the technical solutions when the autocrats are overthrown and governments are forced to be democratically accountable to their citizens. Only then do the technical solutions get implemented and become a success, as we observed in, in the history of the United States and Western Europe and Japan and the more recent history of, gov of governments around the world that have converted from autocracy to democracy. So the bottom line here is simply that, let me just give you the whole bottom line in one sentence. Poverty is actually not caused by a shortage of experts. Poverty is not caused by a shortage of experts. Poverty is caused by a shortage of rights. Poverty is caused by a shortage of rights for poor people. So, what can we do now at this point with these ideas? Uh, many of you are very idealistic like me and want to make the world a better place and want to know what you can do. And the traditional way to say what you can do is like you could become, you could change aid policy, you could become a worker in NGO doing technical solutions. I'm gonna suggest there's another way that you can change the world, which is simply advocate the ideas that you think are correct. If you agree with the kind of point of view that I've stated here, that the democratic rights are the way to make poverty end, then you can simply become an advocate for those ideas. You can protest when the World Bank fails to investigate a human rights violation. You can protest when the World Bank gives aid, financing, repression in a, re in a regime. The history of development ideas confirmed something that John Maynard Keynes said a long time ago. He said the ideas of economists, both when they are right and when they are wrong, are more powerful than is usually understood. Indeed, the world is ruled by little else. Practical men are usually slaves of some defunct economist. That's my dream, to someday be some defunct economist inspiring good ideas. So, you may ask what you can do. We, we have a war of ideas between autocracy and democracy around the world. Today, around the world, from Ukraine to Venezuela to Turkey to Ethiopia, people are fighting for their own freedom. And you can join the War of Ideas to help them fight the battle for their own freedom. They sometimes express the view that democratic rights are some kind of Western value, but I, I really don't believe that. The, uh, the Ethiopian blogger that was sentenced to 18 years in jail that I've already mentioned, Eskinder Nega, gave a pretty eloquent statement of this. He said that democracy should no longer be seen as the esoteric virtue of Westerners but the ubiquitous expression of our common humanity. Tyranny is increasingly unsustainable. It is doomed to failure. So let me close paraphrasing some famous words by, by Abraham Lincoln in the Gettysburg Address that set forward an ideal that we is never perfectly attained, but we try ever harder to keep attaining it, that we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, and Lincoln said in closing the Gettysburg Address, paraphrasing a little bit for development, he said, we here highly resolve that economic development shall have a new birth of freedom, that government of the people, by the people, and for the people shall not perish from here. Thank you. Professors, I have three questions I'll ask you both to respond to with short responses. Um, First being, regarding the global institutions that guide development in the world today, as you've mentioned, the World Bank, uh, the International Monetary Fund, to the United Nations, there's been a long history of this top-down approach, a perpetuation of human rights violations, coupled by many instances of support of corrupt, autocratic leaders. Professors, how would you change these institutions if there was a single most important change you could make um, and you were to run the World Bank, or even an NGO like the Gates Foundation, for that matter. So, uh, I will let 
Professor, so just to the answer the question directly, because uh, I think I would agree with everything he has to say on that. But I want to add to that is that I think it's a mistake to focus only on these institutions. I think that they're very important institutions, very important for development, for the lack thereof, that we are often leaving out of the focus when we think about development. So let me give some examples, right? We have an international financial system that is uh, supporting uh, illicit financial flows, tax evasion by multinational corporations, tax evasion by rich individuals in developing countries very massively, also supports crime and terrorism. And the poor countries are losing somewhere around a trillion dollars a year in terms of these illicit outflows, which are sometimes tax related, but not always. So a trillion dollars a year, to give you a sense, is about eight times as much as all development assistance. So it matters, of course, how much development assistance there is and whether it's well spent or not. But these enormous outflows from developing countries of corrupt money, tax evading money, and so on, are a tremendous headwind against development. Another example is our intellectual property regime that I briefly mentioned already. So we have now, uh, since the founding of the WTO, uh, the so-called TRIPS agreement, which is part and parcel of the WTO agreement, Annex 1C of that agreement. And the TRIPS agreement prescribes a one-size-fits-all intellectual property regime, which requires all WTO member states to grant 20-year product patents on pharmaceuticals, for example. Seeds are another big problem, but let me stay with pharmaceuticals. So India, the most important uh, producer of medicines, had, before the TRIPS agreement took effect, a seven-year process patent regime where clever Indian companies could invent around patents simply by finding a different manufacturing process that would make the same medicine in a different way and they would not violate the patent. This was wonderful news for patients in India and in the rest of the developing world because competing companies in India, generic producers, could manufacture new medicines cheaply and sell them to customers in countries that didn't have these very stringent patent regimes like the developed Western countries did. But with the uh, coming into force of the TRIPS agreement on the 1st of January 2005, India had to change its patent regime and had to now also recognize these 20-year product patents. The product patent uh, leaves no way whatsoever on which a generic company manufacture a new medicine. And so poor patients in India and across the developing world now have to wait until these 20 year patents expire in order to get access to advanced medicines. And in the case of antibiotics, for example, often the efficacy of the drug is already exhausted by the time the patent expires because drug resistance builds up through the use of an antibiotic by, in this case, the richer populations. So that's another example. We can multiply examples, we can talk about climate change, for example, we can lack, talk about the lack of labor standards across the developing world, which leads to a race to the bottom in terms of how uh, in different countries you can treat your workforces. So in all these different ways, you can see that rules, other than those that govern the development aid process, play a very important role in how well poor populations are doing, whether they have a real chance to fend for themselves, to find a way out of poverty. And unless we design these institutions and devise them according to standards of making it easier for poor people to escape poverty, I think poverty will simply continue because the effect of these institutions will overwhelm even the best development uh, aid efforts that we might make. Uh, so if I was the all-powerful head of the World Bank, uh, I'd want to change a lot of things. I'd want us to stop praising dictators, stop financing repression by dictators. Uh, when Human Rights Watch does catch us red-handed uh, in a project that, where our own project contributes to human rights violations, I want to appoint independent investigators to make sure it doesn't happen again. I think most of all, I would really want to have a, a system for development that does not give supreme power to a World Bank chief. I 
don't think the World Bank chief president should have as much power as he, and it usually is a he, has always been a he, as he currently has. So I guess the best thing I could do as World Bank president would be to end my term by firing myself. <laughs> your extensive years of research, would you share with us a personal story about people's lives being positively changed somewhere in the world as a result of this spontaneous solutions to poverty you both speak of? Help us all to better understand that all individuals, including the poorest in the world, know best what can and should be done next when able to exercise their economic and political rights to improve their lives. So uh, I have a close friend in the Philippines, a professor of social science at the University of the Philippines, and in one of my many conversations with her, she told me the story about uh, ridiculous development policies pursued by the Philippine government. In particular, they, this was about the Manyan, a minority in the Philippines living on a distant island. And the government had this wonderful idea to give them goats. And so they got favorable loans, and the government came and gave them these goats. And it turned out that in the mountains where the Manyan were living, the goats were not very functional because the mountains were steep. They were freezing over in the winter. And so the goats were slipping and falling and dying. And so the villagers, in the end, were stuck with loans that they had taken out at subsidized rates, but they had no goats. And so I said to her, you know, what do you think would be a good solution? What do these villagers really need? What do they really want? And she said, what they really need and want is carabao. Carabaos are some sort of water buffalo, a very large animal, and you can use it for plowing, you can use it to bring produce to market, and you can also drink the milk. It's not tasty, I'm told, but it's nutritious. And so I said, I'm willing to pay for a few carabao, and we make an experiment. And so she is a big believer in your principles, actually, of uh, democracy. And so she got all the villagers together and said, look, we have this uh, professor out there who is willing to uh, buy a few carabao for you, but we have to decide together who gets them and how they get, you know, how we will introduce them and so forth. And so the villagers sat down and had a long discussion about which families should be the first to get carabao and so on, and that then other families would get the calves of the carabaos that I would donate. And after this whole plan was decided with, uh, over a long period of time, actually several months of input and discussion, finally uh, we had a solution that everybody was happy with how this would be done. And so I paid for 15 carabao, they were delivered. One unfortunately died pretty much immediately. It was a sick animal, presumably, that uh, had been slipped in there with the rest. But the other 14 survived and were healthy and produced calves and so on. And I'm told that there has been a significant improvement in the standard of living of that set of villages in Manyan country. Still, still growing by leaps and bounds, and shipping the loaves all over, all over a crop. And this was related to another kind of bigger, spontaneous success story that's been happening all over Africa that has helped these kind of entrepreneurs a lot, which is simply the explosion of cell phones. It's something that was not planned. It was not part of any official aid program. It was just something that exploded on, because of local entrepreneurs realized the payoff of cell phones. 
So this, uh, this woman who was expanding her bakery, the one reason it was so successful is that she could communicate with her customers through cell phones. And even very poor people in, in Ghana have cell phones and, and buy minutes, you know, a few minutes at a time from, from uh, cell phone kiosks. And so this combination of an NGO helping a local woman run a bakery combined with private entrepreneurs in Ghana's economy that had fueled the explosion of cell phones made it possible for her to have a very successful business and lift a lot of people out of poverty. Thank you. I'll conclude in a slightly different direction uh, with a question about your academic expertise as you face an audience of students about to embark on extensive university studies in specific disciplines. Can you share with us how you became interested and devoted in your field and topic, as well as an instance in which you had to change your mind as a result of new understanding in the course of your field of study? So I find these questions always hard because one really doesn't know how one develops often sort of autobiographically. But I think three things are important in my life that made me the person I am. The first one is growing up in Germany in the aftermath of the Second World War. I was born in the 50s, and uh, this was sort of, for a kid, uh, an amazing experience to learn gradually what had just happened here. And I sort of said to myself, what? These adults, they just went berserk just 10, 15 years before I was born. They killed lots of people. You guys did this? And so, so it was a very unreal thing. You know, you gradually, uh, you grow up and you think everything is normal, and then you gradually notice it's not normal at all. Something really dramatic happened here not too long ago, and all the adults around me were really involved in one way or the other. They were, fortunately, some of the, my closest relatives were opponents of the regime, but still, it was a dramatic thing. And that sort of gave me a lifelong critical perspective to say the fact that a lot of people agree with something doesn't mean that I should agree with it. I have to always think for myself, and you can't sort of trust the authorities, you can't trust the adults sight unseen, so to speak. The second thing was the Vietnam War, and uh, I was a huge fan of the Americans growing up. You know, they were sending spaceships into space, and that was incredibly exciting, and they had liberated uh, Germany, basically, from the fascists. And and then they were doing this strange thing. They were sending huge air forces into Vietnam and bombing these villages to smithereens, killing hundreds of thousands of people in a very unequal battle. And it seemed to me to be just grotesque. So I became a student demonstrator during those days. And more knowledgeable, I became a walking encyclopedia, actually, about the Vietnam War. I knew everything about the bombs that were being used, the napalm, the free fire zone, the Phoenix program, and so on and so forth and uh, just became very sympathetic to the developing world and developing world causes. And then as a young graduate student early on in my career at Harvard, I did a three or four month trip through Asia, sort of hitchhiking, taking buses and trains and so forth, and saw, I knew that people were poor there, but I had no conception of how poor people were. And I saw in India, for example, people starving. Why I could get about 64 bananas for a dollar. In those days, a dollar bought eight rupees, and a rupee bought eight bananas. And I just couldn't believe how anybody could be starving when bananas could be had for a cent and a half per banana. So I started giving away bananas, but of course soon found that at my little budget, I was unable to feed all of India with bananas, at least all those people who, who needed bananas. And uh, so that also left a deep impression in basically saying that uh, nobody should be living under these conditions and if we can somehow change the world to eradicate this kind of grinding poverty, uh, then that's what we should do. On the question of changing my mind, I mean, I can tell a story, but it's, it is so philosophical and esoteric that I, I'm afraid it would be too complicated for most of the audience. So it's basically, I was a great fan of my of my thesis advisor, John Rawls, uh, who uh, has this idea that we should think about the design of institutions from the point of view of prospective participants. We should always think what we as prospective participants would want from institutional arrangements. And uh, I first thought that this was a perfectly good vantage point from which to assess institutions, but then in the mid-1990s or so, I had a major conversion where I thought that that 
account was still too close to consequentialism, too close to a utilitarian mindset in looking only at the outputs that institutions would produce, uh, what sort of distribution of life prospects they would produce, and being insufficiently sensitive to the causal pathways on which institutions produce their outputs. So I think that an adequate theory of justice has to be sensitive uh, to these pathways and make distinctions between, for example, institutions producing, actively producing harms, like the human rights violations that, that uh, Professor Easterly mentioned, and institutions being insufficiently protective of human rights and doing too little to prevent human rights uh, deficits. And these distinctions between causal pathways, I think, are important, and that's why I've turned to a more deontological theory of justice. So sorry for the esoteric nature of this. Fifties Ohio, where nothing was happening, so that was not a source of inspiration. <laughs> uh, more recently, uh, you know, one part of the question is, you know, you guys are choosing your own kind of paths at this point, and I think one thing to get across is that uh, the, the paths that you actually wind up following. If you, I think any older person will tell you, almost all older people will tell you this that. We all wind up doing things that we never expected to do. And so don't uh, agonize too much about finding the exact right goal or field for yourself, because the actual path of most people's careers is that you wind up doing something that you did not orig originally intend to do. And that was certainly my case. I was um, kind of an academic researcher in the 90s in the World Bank Research Department, publishing obscure articles in obscure academic journals that very few people read. Uh, enough of my fellow academics that I could later get an academic job at NYU when I needed political asylum. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, that was, that was my main activity, was being an academic researcher, and I didn't really expect anything else to happen. I sort of accidentally blundered into the, the, the uh, position of being a, an, an aid critic participating in a big public debate about foreign aid. And that's partly related to uh, a set of incidents that where I did have to change my mind. Um, you know, I had pretty much believed in the World Bank's mission of, of giving expert advice. Uh, but there were several major blunders that I was directly involved in. Uh, one was uh, giving advice to Russia in the early 90s. Uh, there are several, but I'll just only mention one to keep the time short. Uh, I was part of the sort of the first wave of World Bank experts that went into Russia, actually when it was still the Soviet Union, right after the fall of the Berlin Wall. And uh, our advice at that time is uh, what later became known as shock therapy, where we sort of, our, our expert recommendation was that Russia should immediately change everything all at once to switch from a communist economy to a capitalist economy, and should just immediately change everything. It had to be shock therapy to be instantaneous, it could not be gradualist. We did not actually, those of us who were experts were, were not actually experts. We, we did not include people on this trip that actually had been studying the Soviet economy. We included just kind of generic World Bank economists who only knew sort of the economics of the capitalist economy. So we just said, immediately changed this. That was shock therapy. And in retrospect, that was a catastrophic mistake. Uh, that it caused a gigantic uh, depression in Russia, much bigger than the Great Depression of the United States. This is not widely known now. It's now mostly forgotten. But Russia started off its, the first period after it emerged from communism and switched to a new system was one of catastrophic economic depression that had been directly caused by shock therapy because of course, when you change over everything all at once, it just creates chaos and production just kind of disappears because nobody knows what to do, nobody knows what the rules are, everything is changing all at once, everybody's confused. It just created anarchy and chaos and, and it was really a bad, a bad call by the Western experts to kind of force this on Russia. So that was one of the formative experiences that led me to, to be much more critical about how much we experts knew 
And by the way, who, who did actually put us in charge? And that led to being critical of, of the experts and of, of foreign aid. solve the problem just to announce what the technical solution is. Technical solutions don't implement themselves. Somebody has to implement them. And I think the system, I think the traditional approach in development was just to be very careless and not really care about this question of who's doing the implementing and not think about the incentives of who's doing the implementing. And that's what led to the failures of, of foreign aid or the failures to meet the Millennium Development Goal that uh, Professor Poge was talking about. Um, and a system that would give much more political and economic rights to the poor is a way to hold accountable those who are giving the technical solutions. You are able to hold the government accountable in the way I talked about by voting them out of office or money, mounting public protests if something goes wrong. Um, economic rights are also part of the package of, 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 of individual rights and individual freedom. So economic rights give you the ability to choose your own supplier. If, if the supplier uh, of some good that you want gives you a really defective product, then you have the ability to drive them out of business by not buying the product. And that gives you a way to hold private suppliers accountable. So under those conditions, we are all highly, highly motivated to give the right technical solutions to the right people. Thank you. Uh, hello, I'm Linsa, and I'm Dutch and Ethiopian. And I was wondering, I recently read that in China, I think, which isn't the most democratic country out there, they were recently able to have huge development and have energy efficient light bulbs installed nationwide. And this was in part uh, able to happen due to the fact that it wasn't all too democratic and it was really top down administration. And especially juxtaposed with the American politics, which is quite democratic, but also defined by its stagnant nature because everyone's constantly fighting with each other and there are different sides and everyone's trying to get their own ways in democracy. So I was wondering to that extent, especially directed to Easterly, um, can we re is it a bit too idealistic to expect that democracy and good development go hand in hand, especially if even in democracies, political sides are still looking out for their best interests. And I'm not saying this that in the sense that all, all dictatorships are going to be reasonable, like as you mentioned, the Ethiopian one, but is it a bit too idealistic to expect those two to go okay? okay. Um, great question. So, most common question that I ever get asked giving any talk anything like this is what about China? The second most common question is what about China? Uh, third most, no, 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 no. Uh, so, and it's, you know, it's very tempting. So one, another reason the autocratic model has survived for so long in development is that it's very tempting, this idea of the dic dictator and just sort of cut through all the red tape and do, do the right thing. And certainly our own, our own democracy, if we are only thinking of the functioning of the US Congress at the moment, does not look all that attractive. And we've had not very good economic performance since the crisis of, of 2008. Uh, I guess the response to that is to take the long view. I mean, we, 
we really need to use all of the evidence, including the evidence of history. The evidence of history is that the U.S. is, is now at a much, even with the recent kind of disappointing performance and China's recent rapid growth, the U.S. is at a much, much higher level of standard of living than China. That's the long view, and that's the re result of, of, I'm arguing and can, you know, suggest other evidence in support of this if we had time later, that democracy and, and rights are part of the success, long run success story of the U.S. And the China story can also be seen in, in a, another perspective that the recent rapid growth and the recent onset of good things is actually related to uh, an actual change in China from a really totalitarian system under Mao, in which there was just an abysmal, shocking level of, of rights violations and absolute absence of rights, and the Great Leap Forward and the Great Famine, which killed tens of millions, and the Cultural Revolution making all these horrific things happen. And sort of the good things in China, you could, one way to think about them happening is we're, we're getting excited about China basically because it's had a rapid rate of change. It's had very rapid economic growth. It's had rapid introduction of new technologies like the one you mentioned. But this is a change that we're getting excited about because as I mentioned, China's level is still very low compared to the US. It's like one, one sixth or one tenth of the US depending on the numbers you use. And so the change in China's development could be related to the change in freedom, that even though Chinese freedoms are at a very low level, there's been a very positive change since the dark days under, under Mao, under a totalitarian, brutal, brutal system in both economic rights and political rights. And that's made possible, this rapid economic growth. So change in freedom corresponds to change in development, which we call rapid economic growth. Thanks. Hi, professors. Um, my name is Daniel Osmani. I'm from Romania. And so my question is basically, uh, in our in Eunice, arguably one of the most international schools in the world, we're taught that in our clubs or in the classroom setting, we're taught that we're taught that we should simply, you know, raise funds to, as Mr. Easley said, to um, for solution, more technical solutions such as, you know, uh, inoculation, immunizations, food, clothes, etc. But we're not really, there's no focus, and we're not really told to concentrate on um, people's rights in these developing countries. So my question is, do you think that students should focus, should be taught to um, focus more in school clubs or in the classroom on protecting and defending the rights of people in these developing countries as opposed to merely um, raising funds to send off you know, to some probably not very cost effective um, organization? Um, and what do you think students around the world, not just here in the United Nations International School, should be doing more to lean to, more towards protecting and defending human rights and decreasing government corruption, as opposed to um, as opposed to uh, as opposed to uh, raising funds for food and more te these technical solutions that you were talking about? If that makes any sense. Uh, makes a lot of sense, yeah. So I would say uh, all of the above. So I would say three things. Uh, yes, it's good often to raise funds and to support development efforts, and there you have to really watch out that you support the right efforts. So there are websites like, for example, givewell.org, where a bunch of prominent economists are trying to vet various NGOs to see which ones of them really are the most effective and it can make all the difference in the world. You can uh, dissipate $500 and have nothing to show for it in the end or even do more harm than good if you give to the wrong organization. And you can do a great deal of good if you give it to the right organization. Secondly, I also support the second project, the one that you highlight human rights abuses and uh, try to do something about them and also make sure that international organizations are not collaborating in these human rights violations. And the third thing that I would add, consistent with what I said earlier, is that it's very important to think about our international institutional framework, which also, in many ways, is human rights violating. So, for example, by arm-twisting developing countries into adopting this very powerful intellectual property rights regime, we have essentially uh, made various transactions between generic companies producing cheap medicines and patients who need these medicines, impossible. We have arm-twisted the Indian government on clamping down on these transactions and thereby 
pretty actively deprived the poor people in the developing world of access to these advanced medicines. So that I see as also a human rights violation and one that we are, I mean, not you as a Romanian so much, but uh, we in the richer countries are pretty directly responsible for. I know you are now an EU member, so, okay, you can be We're responsible. trying our best. Yeah, okay, so I think these are the three things to focus on, and the, the thing that I would most add is the third, that we should think systemically and think about what it is about our international institutional architecture that works so heavily against the poor. Thank you. Hi, my name is Ruth. I'm from Uganda. Um, and coming from an African country, um, and just having personal experience with this, um, both of you mentioned something to the extent of micro-lending and micro-loans, as in giving uh, funds or loans to people who otherwise wouldn't be able to uh, get loans because of lack of collateral and because of their economic um, situation. Um, so I was wondering if you thought that microfinance and microlending is a sustainable means of um, development, poverty eradication at least, um, because it does respect um, the individual rights of the poor, but then it can also be, um, like there are also downsides to the entire process. So I was just wondering like, what, you were, what your stance is on that. So very briefly, I think that, uh, as you say, this is a two-edged sword. So uh, micro-lending has worked well in some areas for some people, but it's also because of the high interest rates, because the loans are very small, and in order to uh, service them, in order to have all the overhead in place that you need in order to maintain these loans, administer these loans, the interest rates are often very high, as in somewhere around 60, 70, 80 percent per year. And that can be quite a significant burden. Uh, and then, of course, there's the further thing that uh, you know, some people lending at even higher rates and so on. So uh, they were claimed to be a kind of panacea, but in the end have been uh, a big burden for many people. Now, I think the two things that I've been involved in a little bit that I think are in the same domain, but maybe more useful, one is microinsurance. So I've been involved with a, a, a big mutual fund that is called LeapFrog. And LeapFrog is uh, giving money or using the money that it raises to invest in microinsurance companies and then revamping them, making them more efficient. And I think that's a very useful thing for poor people because poor people often are just one little step away from catastrophe, right? If grandma gets sick or if there's a funeral needed or a wedding or a sickness in the family, anything like that can mean the difference between having a more or less stable existence on the brink of disaster and actually falling into disaster. So microinsurance is something that works differently from loans but is, uh, I think, often much more useful for people. Another thing is having effective banking services. We now have wonderful electronics, so it's very easy and cheap to allow people to have a bank account, maybe to have money stored on their cell phone. Many people in the developing world now have cell phones. And if you have money stored on your cell phone, one thing you can do is you can go shopping with it, you can keep it safe, which is often a real problem for poor people. And you can also transfer it, which is often a big problem. Often families are divided. Uh, the husband may work in the city and send money home to the family. And if you have an electronic bank account, this is very easily doable. You don't have to try to find somebody you can read and write to put money into an envelope to send it to you, maybe even put the wrong address on it and send it to himself and so on and so forth. But you can do it electronically, which is easy to learn and keeps the money safe. So these sorts of services uh, would seem to me to be more promising and more worth expanding than micro-lending. Question is uh, to Mr. Isun uh, about the uh, how. Okay, so you, you're saying that uh, there's uh, 
the financial aid that goes to the developing countries, like the government is corrupt. And how do you think we should uh, supervise uh, the uh, supervise the, the financial aid? Should there be an organization that overse uh, oversees uh, how how it should be handled, or and if there is no such organization developed? Do you believe that uh, it's going to be worse after 10 years, there's going to be a higher rate of corruption, or it's going to stay the same? Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, well, you know, corruption is definitely part of the picture, but I was, um, I think the more important dimension is the, the dictatorship that gives governments the power to do what they want to the citizens and fails to leave them any incentive to do the technical solutions that would end poverty. Uh, so what to do about aid, how, how can aid uh, be sort of overseen to make it better? You know, part of the problem is that, I mean, the, the democratic rights, they work well, I, I would argue they work well in making, not perfectly, but they work well in making our government, so for example, in the US, they work well in making our government at home do good things to us and not do too many bad things to us. You know, again, not perfectly, but they, they have some great positive effect in that direction. The problem is, the weak spot is it does not necessarily, our, our democratic rights do not make U.S. foreign policy necessarily benevolent, or, or foreign aid that is part of U.S. foreign policy necessarily benevolent. So if, for example, we're giving, the, there's a U.S. aid program to Latvia, well, Latvians don't vote in U.S. elections. They, have, they don't have any ability, Latvians don't have any ability to, to hold U.S. politicians who are doing bad foreign policy or aid programs in Latvia to hold them accountable. That's sort of the weak spot. Of, that's the blind spot of democracy. Is there's nothing that makes the foreign policy of democracies or the foreign aid of democracy necessarily benevolent. I think the best that we can hope for is, I, there actually are already organizations that oversee foreign aid, including within the World Bank, there's a part of the World Bank that oversees what the rest of the World Bank does, which is not very effective. And I don't think the answer is a new organization. The answer is really, again, us citizens, us global citizens, exercising our, our democratic rights, our rights, the rights of free speech, to protest human rights violations in which the World Bank might be directly or indirectly involved in. That's the main hope, it's, it's change. And for that to happen, we first have to mobilize uh, uh, that we actually care about rights. And I think because of the prevalence of this sort of technical approach of development, we've traditionally in development have really not cared very much about rights. It's just a lack of caring. So really all that, you know, the first thing that has to happen is just to kind of change the way we think about development in which rights are much more at the center both as an end in themselves and as a way that development happens, so we would just care more, and then if we cared more, then the, there would not be so many uh, aid agencies getting away with rights violations. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Emery, and I'm from the US. Um, my question was about cleaner energy. Um, since we know that global warming at this point is irreversible, but we're trying to uh, deal with it, I guess, and reduce the rate of which uh, we see global warming affects us, and we know that um, it affects poor farmers dramatically if their uh, crops are affected by droughts or by floods. Um, and, well, my question was, uh, how do we get cleaner energy into developing countries um, without really seeing uh, outside uh, organizations or countries completely uh, completely run the, the projects and then to later see it structurally fall apart. Um, and also how do we kind of prevent uh, cleaner energy from dramatically increasing prices of energy uh, if, it, if we know that it's uh, extremely expensive to, to uh, install, I guess, into these developing countries. 
So one very important hurdle here, one very important price increaser is uh, just the intellectual property again, right? And so we have green technologies, clean technologies, and they are very good often, but they're not getting used in the developing world because the developing world organizations that would like to use them have to pay licensing fees to the inventor. Now that is unbelievably stupid. Right, it's unbelievably stupid that we discourage developing countries from using the newest, greenest, cleanest technologies by charging licensing fees when the technology has already been invented. So that's not to say that the inventor shouldn't be rewarded. Yes, the inventor should be rewarded, but not by giving them the power to mark up the price, but rather by giving them a reward that is proportional to the green impact of the innovation. So if you say to the innovators, you know, you invent new green technologies and we pay you out of some global fund in proportion to the emissions that you avert with your invention. So the more people use your invention and the more that invention reduces greenhouse gas emissions, the more money you get paid. Then the incentives would be reversed, right? The innovator would go out there and beg people in the developing world, please use my invention. You can get it for free. I even pay you to use it because I get rewarded on the basis of the green impact of that invention being used. How would we fund it? Well, we would fund it, for example, through an international tax on uh, very bad pollution. So the power plants using brown coal, for example, which are among the worst polluters, uh, tax these kinds of polluting uses, create a fund, and then with that fund, reward green, green innovators in proportion to the environmental impact of the inventions. Thank you. One more excellent question. Hi, um, my name is Emma. I'm from the United States. So you both suggested um, solutions as to how we can better eradicate poverty uh, through democratic governments and new taxation laws. Um, but I'm wondering how is it uh, that you suggest we implement those uh, beneficial ways to eradicate poverty with uh, autocratic governments fighting against democratic governments and uh, the system of anarchy where there's no one to enforce these new laws of taxation. Yeah, I'll make a, make a first step. So I think that uh, the problem isn't just the contrast between democratic governments and authoritarian governments, as if the democratic governments were all very strongly in favor of poverty eradication and development. I think that even the democratic governments produce great obstacles. And the obstacles, I mean, look at the United States as the most powerful government on earth, as the main uh, country still in international negotiations where the rules of the game get negotiated, the big trade rules and finance rules and so forth. And the United States is nominally a democracy, but as the last Supreme Court judgment a few days ago reminded us once again, it's a democracy that's closer to the ideal of one dollar, one vote, rather than to the ideal of one person, one vote. And so the point there is that in our democracy in the United States, uh, the large banks, the multinational corporations, the industry associations, the hedge funds, and the billionaires have a vastly disproportionate influence on the United States policies, both domestically and especially also in foreign policy. And here, I mean, lobbying is, is the second oldest profession, it's oldest in the world, but here is something new about lobbying, that more and more of the lobbying efforts of these big players are now directed at the formation of international rules, because international rules have become very important in the last 30 years or so since the end of the Cold War. And these international rules have a profound effect on the distribution of income and wealth in the world. Of course, these very powerful agents uh, who are lobbying the US government and other powerful governments to get certain rules adopted at the international level, of course what they want is to enrich themselves. They want rules that are favorable to themselves and rules that are favorable to multinationals and big banks and hedge funds and billionaires are not the rules that are most favorable to poor people. 
So I think that's a very important component of the problem that you also have to keep in mind that democracies are not automatically pro-poor, to the contrary. Um, yeah, I, I agree with Professor Poge on this. Um, um, let's use U.S. stick to the example of U.S. democracy, which is still very much a work in progress. And part of the part of the way in which it's not working is that uh, ethnic minorities are still the victims of, of racism and and of poor public services and of voter voter laws that, that uh, are specifically target them to make it more difficult for them to register to vote, which are very much wrong. And of course, and of course, the leading example here is, is African Americans in our in our society who suffer from from inadequate schools and public services because of these reasons. The the good news is that there there has been progress over time. And so I think this sort of closes things on a more hopeful note. I mean the and I, it gets back to the ideals that I, ideals and principles of of freedom and equal rights for all are really powerful ideas that people are willing to risk their lives for. And we saw that in the US civil rights movement that, was, you know, that many of you have studied in school, that, uh, that by you know, Martin Luther King articulated eloquently ideals like you know, that he had a dream, that, that everyone would be free at last, that, he, that the promissory note that all men are created equal would finally be honored in the United States. And he was able to use that ideal to shame southern, especially southern whites, but also northern whites for their hypocrisy and believing that rights only apply, that their rights for, were for whites. Whites for what? It's kind of a tongue twister. What, rights for whites and not for anyone else. And that, that shame, that hypocrisy was a powerful force for change that was implemented in the civil rights movement. And so I'm hopeful that those, those ideals still have a lot of power left in them, that if we just act, stick to advocating this, these principles that all men are created equal, all men and women are created equal, all ethnic groups are created equal, that, that is a positive force for social change that gives us hope.